Hello, everybody. Um, have you all got your mobile phones handy? Can you grab your phone for me? Thank you. And I just want you to open, if you have a notes app or some way of being able to write yourself a note, that would be great. What I'd like you to do is just spend 30 seconds on thinking about you. And in that notes app, I would like you to just jot down some of the things that are on your mind. You've been listening to an awful lot today and taking a lot on board, I'm sure. But just thinking about you, thinking about what you're responsible for, what and who, also uh, your priorities, any situations you've got going on at the moment, and just jot down as many of those ideas as you possibly can. Okay, you've got 30 seconds. If it seems a bit random, don't worry about it, just write it down anyway. It doesn't have to be in any particular order. Just as many things as you can get down in that time. Okay, five seconds, no pressure. Super typing, that's what we need. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Now, if I gave you half an hour, you probably could keep going and putting things in that list. Um, and I want you to keep hold of that list and we'll come back to it at the end of the talk, okay? Now, the metaphor metamorphic relationship that I want to talk about today is the therapeutic one. My, um, my profession is in mental health, I'm a psychotherapist, and um, I'm very passionate about how this relationship can really help people. And often, when people come for support, they have a really long list of lots of things that they're holding in their minds. Things that they maybe don't even recognize sometimes, sometimes not in any particular order, but feels quite messy. And two things I hear quite a lot. One is, I don't know where to start. And the other one is, I don't even know where some of these things come from. So using a therapeutic relationship can be massively powerful in helping people to move forward from where they are to where they could be. And sometimes that might even be different to what they even thought they could do. Therapy is about investing in yourself. It's about investing time and space and reflection. Uh, often sessions are taking place every week, but that might only be an hour. So it's the work that's done in between that time as well. And spending time on ourselves and our mental health and our emotional well-being is probably more important now than I've ever seen in my 20-year career. And I've worked and had the pleasure of working and the honor of working with clients as young as four or five years old, right through to people in their mid-80s, proving that it's never too young and you're never too old to try and do some self-development um, and to learn about yourself. Sometimes we make assumptions about ourselves and using a space to actually talk to somebody who isn't a family member and who isn't a friend and who doesn't have an opinion can be really helpful, just a really safe space. Also, when investing that time and energy into yourself, that investment pays dividends over a really long period of time. How many of you sometimes, when you're feeling a bit down, might go and buy something new? You know, a new outfit, a new pair of shoes, new gym gear. I can see people smiling going, oh, maybe, maybe that's me. And we all do that, but those are temporary fixes. And when we're thinking about a longer-term investment, when we're thinking about therapy and that metamorphic relationship, that is something that pays dividends beyond the therapeutic relationship. It pays dividends for the rest of our lives because we can't unlearn what we've learned in that process. Does that make sense? Okay, so... I'm probably the only speaker who's had a potato on a slide today. Um, <laughs> but Carl Rogers was mentioned earlier, and this is who this is about. Carl Rogers came up with a person-centered approach to counseling and psychotherapy, and he's been very influential in our ways of working. And he uses the analogy of a potato. So when he was a young boy, in the basement of his house, there was a bin with potatoes in it and a small window. And what he noticed was that even though the conditions in that basement weren't the right conditions, particularly for really good growth, the potatoes were still trying to grow. So the sprouts and the shoots would be white and spindly, and they'd be trying to go towards that window. He used that analogy in terms of people, and he believed that we all have an innate desire to grow and to develop and to self-actualize and to become that person that we want to be. And that's what that theory is built on. So when we're thinking about the right conditions for growth, 
what are we talking about? Well, if you Google therapy images, quite often this is what comes up. And thankfully, we've moved on from this. No longer do you go and see someone and they say, lay on a couch, I'm going to sit behind you, and this is going to be really weird. Where there's no eye contact and no relationship. One of the main things with therapy is the relationship. Aside from the model that we might be using, or the way of working, you've got to get on with the person that you're working with. Okay? So the, the therapy has moved on, the way of working has moved on, and also, if we think about this kind of way of working, the stigma is starting to move on too. I would say that in my career, I've seen a difference in that stigma shift around mental health, and definitely since COVID, because there's definitely been more people who have been struggling. But the client has to be in the right place to do the work. You know, you can't do therapy to somebody. They have to be uh, motivated, even if that is a tiny, tiny bit of motivation. They have to want things to be different. We can't do something to someone and take accountability and responsibility for them. We have to help them to take that on for themselves. So what do we need to do for the person seeking help? Well, I think whatever works, whatever's going to help that person. For example, being able to access services easily without being treated as a number and put onto waiting lists, or passed around different services because no one quite knows what to do or how to help that person. We also need to make sure that we work in a way that meets their needs. So behind me is an image of one of our therapy rooms where, you know, only just last week a client came in, kicked their shoes off, wrapped themselves in a throw, had a coffee, you know, and just had a therapy session like that. The other image is one going on a walk with someone. But these, these therapeutic sessions can take place anywhere. You know, we can do them online, we can do them on the telephone, we can do them in spaces near water, outside, whatever works for the person who's looking for that help. The main thing really is we treat people as people and not just somebody who is coming into a service and just sits and waits to be seen. Anyone a fan of Harry Potter? Yes? Yes, good, excellent. Okay, so I'm not going to argue with Dumbledore, but I kind of am. So Dumbledore, in this quote behind me, he thinks that words, in his not-so-humble opinion, are our most inexhaustible source of magic, capable of both inflicting injury and remedying it. And I would say that that is very true. There are lots of different talking therapies out there, whether they're looking at the person-centered approach, cognitive approaches, systemic, uh, psych psychoanalytical, all sorts of different things. And they can work for what people need, whether that's couples or families or individuals of any age. However, sometimes words have a limitation. Sometimes we're trying to articulate the unfathomable. We're trying to put words to something that doesn't really do it justice. So using creativity, we've heard a lot about creativity today. Using creativity can be massively helpful when we're thinking about how to express ourselves. How many people here would consider themselves to be creative? Yeah? And do you find it quite therapeutic when you're doing that work, whatever that might be? Yeah, when well, that might be growing vegetables, or it might be painting. Generally speaking, when we think about creativity, and something we hear in the UK a lot is, I'm not very good at drawing. That's adults, usually. And it isn't about that. This is about expression, use of color, use of the medium, so the way that we do it. I've brought you a couple of examples here to show you today. So these are masks that we use in therapy. And on the outside, you can see how people have represented themselves in terms of how they present to the world. So on this one, you can see there's a question mark and a smiley face. On this one is a lady, and she is also smiling. Um, and under there, it says, I'm OK. So presenting to the world, actually doing all right, nobody needs to know that actually things are different on the inside. It's taken from a Jungian way of working, from the persona on the outside to the shadow on the inside. So this is how people really felt on the inside. If I try and describe those, I'm probably not going to do it justice. But the image itself tells us a lot, doesn't it, about how people might be feeling, yeah? So if we think about this one, we probably can't see, but there's a green hot air balloon at the top there. And this guy felt that he just couldn't get hold of his thoughts. His thoughts were drifting all the time. If you met him, he's a really happy-go-lucky, engaging person, but on the inside was feeling very lost. And the same with this lady here you know, asking for help across the mouth there, but not being able to ask for it and just saying, I'm OK. So using creativity can take any form. We can use sand, 
objects, buttons are my favorite. Um, we might use music, anything that works for the person in terms of how they want to express. And some of this stuff is hidden. It's things that haven't been expressed maybe ever. It's the unsaid. It's the self-talk. All of us have got that voice in our heads going round and round. And actually, for me, being honored enough to be able to share that with someone is really important because that's often something that's linked to shame and embarrassment and all of those other feelings like guilt. So what's the therapist doing? Well, the ther therapist should be doing this. They should be all in. They should be all ears, really actively listening to what the person is saying and what they're bringing, but also being really open and non-judgmental, empathic, um, genuine, a bit of humor thrown in there as well, really building that rapport with a person so they understand that actually it's okay to bring whatever they need to bring to that session. The therapist has a really important role in facilitating the process for the client and being the container for people to be able to experiment and to be able to think about things that have happened. That might be relatively small things, it might be huge incidences, it could be traumatic events. But it's really important that it's the right person, the right therapist. Anyone who's ever gone for support and it's been the wrong person knows that actually that can be quite disruptive. The other theme that I hear a lot about is about choice. People will often say, I don't have a choice. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Um, you know, I've had to take the job. I had to do this. I had to do that. And we always have choices. We might not like them. We might not like what the options are, but we do always have choices, things that we can take, decisions we can make. We also might make the wrong choice. And for me, that's the, where the learning happens. You know, we make the wrong choices, we get things wrong all the time, or at least I do. And actually, the learning process that comes from that is really important. One of the other themes that we hear a lot about is boundaries. How many people here will say yes to something when really you want to say no? Oh, I see loads of people. <laughs> Yeah, so when we're thinking about boundaries, we want to please others and we want to do the right thing by other people. Learning to look after our boundaries, learning when to say no and to be able to be really clear about that is massively important with our mental health. It protects us, it creates that space around us. The other thing is about courage. The courage to dig deep, and I don't mean just dig deep into memories, and sometimes we don't need to do that in order to help someone to move forward, but I do mean dig deep into courage. You know, this process is hard work, it's not easy, and quite often people will feel worse before they feel better. And we have to trust each other that actually we're both in it together and we're going to figure out a way forward and there will be a better outcome. So let's take this idea a step further. For me, the counselling and psychotherapy profession like to keep it very much about the work that they do. And I think there's an awful lot more that we can do with the skills and the training we've had in different industries. So I've worked in emergency services, within health services, education, chemical process plants, all sorts of places, providing this kind of metamorphic therapeutic relationship. It only works if both of us are doing it together. And it can happen within um, a leadership team. You know, if somebody's managing a team or running a business, if they start to make changes, the ripple effect from that is that it impacts on them, their relationships, their family, their teams, their culture. It moves out in that way. So if we can provide that relationship in a bit more of a flexible and adapted way, then obviously that's going to create massive benefits, not just for the person engaging, but for people who are around them as well. So this is a quote taken from Sally. Sally has given me permission to use her as an example. It's not her real name. Sally is um, a business owner, and she is also um, in a long-term marriage and has two children. And 18 months ago, was trying to run her business. She was also trying to be a really good mum, really good wife, and trying to do all these different roles, but actually not feeling that she was finding her feet with any of it. We've been working together once a month for the last 18 months for a couple of hours a month, 
And she's really committed to the work. She's really worked hard. She's experimented with things around the patterns of behavior that she has, her attachments and bonds from when she was younger, the traumatic events she's experienced. And from that, has been able to build herself from being somebody who wasn't really sure where she wanted to go, what her commitment to her direction was. She's actually managed to create a team within her business. She feels much more um, secure and safe at home, and her relationships are much better than they were. And also, her business has grown. We've never looked at the bottom line, and we've never looked at her turnover. She's gone from a 90,000 pound turnover a year to over a million in less than 18 months, just because she's in a different place. So the ripple effect is really important, and for her, recognizing that she was getting in her own way was one of the most important parts of the work. So, what's the point? We're looking to help people to fly solo. You know, we're constantly working towards the ending of the relationship, where people feel self-assured enough to be able to go and do this for themselves with everything they've learned, understanding all their triggers, understanding all the strategies and all the ideas that can help them. Learning to fly solo can be a scary moment. And for me, one of the great things to be able to do is if you've done the groundwork within a metamorphic therapeutic relationship, it means that it's something you can go back to and check in with when you need to. It might be six months down the line or a year down the line, sometimes just having the odd session just to be able to get some clarity. One of the things that social media is teaching us to do is to look for gurus, you know, to find people out there who know more than we do about ourselves. And actually, nobody knows more about us than we do. And learning about yourself, however that might be, whether it's within therapy, whether it's about self-development, emotional intelligence, all of those different aspects, is always going to feel that you have um, the um, direction within your grasp, that it is your, your opportunity. So we want to learn to fly solo, and we don't want gurus. We want to be our own guru. Okay, I'd like you to go back to the list that you did at the beginning. Just have a quick look at it for me. How many people had themselves on that list? Okay, few. Brilliant. How many people had themselves at the top of that list? Okay, less. <laughs> How many people didn't have them themselves on the list at all? And is willing. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm pleased that works. That was a real gamble. That could have gone either way. Um, the, the purpose of doing the list is to think about, actually, where are you on the list? How often do you take time to look after yourself, to look after your self-care, your well-being? You know, self-care isn't being selfish. It's necessary. And as somebody who is a wife and a mother of three teenage children, with all of that goes with that, and running a business, I know more than anybody what it means in order, you know, to look after yourself. However, if you're struggling, there is a metamorphic, therapeutic relationship waiting for you to opt into. Thank you.